Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on exothermic and endothermic reactions. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you're confident on um, covalent bonding, um, ionic bonding, and the material on rates of chemical reactions. In this video, we'll be looking at what exothermic and endothermic reactions are. Then we'll be looking at how we can measure the energy change in a reaction experimentally. Then we'll be exploring what happens when you break and form chemical bonds, because that will help us to explain whether reactions are endo or exothermic. And from that, finally, we can draw reaction profiles for reactions. OK, so what do we mean by exothermic reactions? An exothermic reaction is a chemical reaction that releases heat energy. And so it warms its surroundings. The temperature increases. Um, and in these reactions, in an exothermic reaction, energy is transferred from the chemical store of the chemicals bonds to the thermal store of the surroundings and by the surroundings we're talking about the chemicals themselves they will warm up um, as will any solution that the chemicals are reacting in as will any container that the chemicals are reacting in and more generally their wider surroundings so heat is released the temperature of everything around the reaction will increase Examples of this include combustion. This is our, our sort of main, most common example. Um, any kind of burning reaction is exothermic. So, you know, whether it's a, a bonfire or a log fire to warm a house or the gas flame uh, warming your boiler at home, all of those are exothermic combustion reactions. The next one we've got is neutralization reactions between acids and alkalis. These are always exothermic. Displacement reactions, where a more reactive element displaces a less reactive element from a compound, again, always exothermic. Some precipitation reactions are exothermic. You know, those are reactions where mixing two solutions produces an insoluble um, product. S dissolving some salts is also exothermic. Some are endothermic, but a lot are also exothermic. Um, and respiration, this is a super important one for all living things, um, where oxygen combines with glucose to um, produce carbon dioxide and water and release the energy that is needed to power um, living things. And finally, freezing and condensation. These are also exothermic. Now, that might seem a bit counterintuitive because in your head you're like, well, to freeze something you have to cool it down. But really think that through. That means that when you cool it down, the heat energy in the uh, water, for example, is released. And that releasing energy reduces the energy of the water, allowing it to freeze. OK, so what about endothermic reactions? Now, these are chemical reactions that absorb heat energy from their surroundings. So we can identify endothermic reactions in one of two ways. Either they become colder. So some reactions, you, you'll do them at room temperature, and the temperature will drop to sort of 10 degrees or even below zero. Um, the more common way, though, is that they require an external heat source to keep them going. So most endothermic reactions simply won't take place at room temperature. So we have to heat them with a Bunsen burner or some other heat source to keep them going. Now, what's happening in an endothermic reaction is that energy is transferred from the thermal energy store of the surroundings to the chemical store of the chemicals bonds. And that's why the temperature goes down, because thermal energy has been removed from the surroundings. So examples of this include things like um, some precipitation reactions, dissolving some salts. So we can see that happening here. So an example of this is sodium chloride. If you dissolve sodium chloride in water at room temperature, because it's an endothermic process, the temperature of that water will go down slightly. Photosynthesis is a super important one. We can see photosynthesis happening in this leaf here. And although it doesn't absorb thermal energy, it absorbs light energy, this still counts as an endothermic reaction. Um, and importantly, melting and boiling. Now, again, this can seem counterintuitive. You know, you think about a pan of water as being hot, and so you assume, therefore, that must be an exothermic reaction. But actually, if you really think about it, to get the pan of water hot, you have to constantly supply it with thermal energy from the hob or from a flame of some kind. And so it's only by absorbing that thermal energy from the surroundings that the pan of water can boil. Now, how do we experimentally measure energy changes? Well, 
the first thing we do is we place one of our chemical reactants into an insulated beaker. And by an insulated beaker, we're talking something like a, um, a polystyrene coffee cup, that kind of thing. Okay. Now, the next thing we do is we measure the starting temperature with a thermometer. Then what we do is we get our second reactant and we add it to the beaker and we place an insulated lid on top. Then we allow the reaction to proceed and we measure the temperature again once the reaction is complete. And that's really important. We need to measure a temperature change here. So we must measure the temperature at the start and then again at the end. And in terms of interpreting our results, if the temperature rises, then the reaction is exothermic because energy has been released to the surroundings and warmed them up. And if the temperature decreases or it falls, the reaction is endothermic because thermal energy has been absorbed from the surroundings and cooled them down. Now, it's worth just making a note about the insulation. You'll see that we mentioned we need an insulated beaker, we need an insulated lid. Um, and the reason why for both of those is to prevent heat escaping to the outside and also to prevent heat entering from the outside because we want to make sure that we're just measuring temperature changes are involved directly with the reaction itself and not anything to do with the surroundings. Now, in order to be able to explain why some reactions are exothermic and others are endothermic, we need to think first about what happens when you break and when you make chemical bonds. Now, breaking chemical bonds is endothermic, so it absorbs energy. Um, to understand that, it might be worth thinking about what happens when you separate two magnets. Now, if two magnets are stuck together, you have to separate them by pulling them apart, and that requires energy. It absorbs energy to separate two magnets in much the same way as it absorbs energy to separate two atoms that are bonded together. On the opposite hand, making or forming chemical bonds is exothermic. That means it releases energy. Again, think about our magnets analogy. You've, you've seen the way that two magnets will snap themselves together. And as they do that, they make a little audible click. And that is them releasing energy as they attract towards each other. It's the same with two atoms. When they are attracted to each other to form a bond, that releases energy as well. Now, why this is relevant? Well, in a chemical reaction, old chemical bonds have to first be broken before new ones are formed. So if we look at an example, imagine we wanted hydrogen, H2, to react with chlorine. The first step in those two molecules reacting with each other is the hydrogen-hydrogen bond and the chlorine-chlorine bond must be broken. And that will produce individual atoms of hydrogen and chlorine that can then react with each other. Now, that process of breaking the bonds is endothermic. So energy is absorbed in the first step of this chemical reaction. So once we've got those separate atoms, they can now bond with each other. And in doing that, they release energy. And we can see that here. So that little spark there is supposed to show that energy released as the hydrogens and the chlorines bond with each other. So that process releases energy. And we see this in every single chemical reaction. Always it starts with some energy being absorbed whilst we break old chemical bonds and then some energy being released whilst we make new chemical bonds. Now, what we find is that if we break stronger bonds, that absorbs more energy. And equally, if we form stronger bonds, that releases more energy. So the difference in the strength of the bonds that we break and the strength of the bonds that we form, that will determine whether a reaction is endo or exothermic. OK, so what we're going to do now is apply the ideas from the previous slide to explain why some reactions are endothermic whilst others are exothermic. Now, before we do that, let's remind ourselves that breaking bonds always absorbs energy, whilst forming bonds always releases energy, and that the stronger the bonds, the more energy is absorbed or released. So what about exothermic reactions? So exothermic reactions occur when weaker 
bonds are broken. So that means less energy is absorbed. Whilst stronger bonds are formed. So that means more energy is released. So what this means is overall more energy is released than is absorbed. So overall across the whole reaction energy gets released. On the other hand reactions are endothermic when stronger bonds are broken which means that more energy is absorbed whilst weaker bonds are formed which means that less energy is released. So this means that more energy is absorbed than released so overall energy is absorbed. Okay so now we're going to combine ideas from the previous few slides to produce what we call a reaction profile and in this case it will be for an exothermic reaction. So a reaction profile is simply a graph that plots on the x-axis the reaction progress that's how far we've moved from reactants towards the products and on the y-axis we plot the energy and it's specifically the chemical energy of the reactants and products not the thermal energy of the surroundings. Now when we do this we produce a graph like this where we can see that the products have less chemical energy than the, than the reactants. If we look at the graph, we can see up here the reactants have got a lot of energy and down here the products have got less energy and that's because they've lost that chemical energy to their surroundings. So we can say then that the energy change of the reaction is negative because the products have lost energy. We can see there that big drop that is our negative energy change. Now this might seem counterintuitive but the reason why is because that chemical energy that's been lost is the thermal energy that is being uh, given out to the surroundings. So that's why the surroundings have got hotter because the reactants have lost energy to form the products. Now we'll also see we've got this small hump here and that's an important feature of the graph. That small hump that represents the activation energy of the reaction. And if we remind ourselves from the uh, rates of reaction unit, the activation energy is the minimum energy required for two colliding particles to react. And we can see that that is a small amount of energy. Um, it is the that difference between the reactants and the top of the graph that is our small activation energy. So let's try and explain what's going on here. Well, if we start off by having our two reactants that we saw on the previous slide, say our hydrogen H2 and our chlorine Cl2. Now before they can react with each other, we've got to break the bonds between them and that absorbs energy, breaking some relatively weak bonds. And so that leads us to this state up here where those atoms have more energy than the uh, molecules that they've come from because energy has been absorbed to get them to that state. Now when those hydrogens and chlorines react, react with each other and we form new bonds we get a whole load of energy released so we get this big downward slope representing the large amount of energy being released by forming those stronger bonds and so the difference in the energy absorbed to make our atoms and the energy released to make our molecules that is the overall energy change of the reaction. Okay so now we'll look at the reaction profile for an endothermic reaction and maybe unsurprisingly we'll see it's the exact opposite um, of the exothermic reaction and it looks like this. So on this reaction profile for the endothermic reactions the products have more chemical energy than the reactants and we can see that here we can see our reactants low down on the energy axis and our products high up on the energy axis. So what that means then is that the energy change of the chemicals not of the um, surroundings the energy change of the chemicals is positive because the products have gained energy now that might seem counterintuitive because you'd think surely if they're gaining energy then things will get hotter but we have to understand we're talking about the chemical energy of the products and so if they've gained energy they must have got it from somewhere and they get it by absorbing the thermal energy from the surroundings and converting it into the chemical energy. So that's why the surroundings cool down, even though the products are actually gaining energy. Now the activation energy is large and we can see that here. So this gray arrow that is showing our high activation energy and um, it's worth pointing out that that is the dis difference between the energy of the reactants 
and the very top of our graph. So it's that full height there. That's the same as it is on the exothermic one. The exothermic one was the difference between the reactants and the top of the graph as well, but the reactants were much higher then, so that meant the activation energy was smaller. A common mistake is that people think that with the endothermic reaction, the activation energy is this change here between the products and the top, and that is not the case. It's always between the reactants and the top. Now, in terms of explaining what's happening here, let's think about a reaction. So we're going to have two HCl molecules reacting with each other to convert themselves back to H2 and Cl2. Now, the first step in that reaction is that we've got to break those chemical bonds. But because they're very strong, we need to absorb a large amount of energy. And so this big upslope here, that represents the large amount of energy being absorbed to break these chemical bonds and convert those two molecules into those four individual atoms. Now, those can then react with each other to produce our hydrogen and chlorine. But because that only makes weak bonds, we get this small downslope representing only a little energy being released by forming those weaker bonds. And so then overall, the energy change is positive because more energy is absorbed than is released. OK, so that's it. The end. As always, thank you for listening and well done if you got this far.